Okay, uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Frans Woord. Uh, I work at Surfnet, the Dutch NREN, uh, the Dutch uh, National um, Research and Educational Network Provider. But today I'm here uh, as a board member of the Media Mosa Foundation. Um, I have a question to you all. Um, can you raise a hand if you are familiar or have you <coughs> heard about Minimosa before? <coughs> Two? Ah. So for those people, I, I don't want you know, to be a boring talk, or well, at least the, the first 10 minutes is <coughs> because I'm explaining about Minimosa. Um, you can uh, have a stop after. <laughs> and then. For the rest of you, there's more, but only uh, if you pay attention, because uh, when we come to the Q&A uh, se session, then I will have more stroke off. So I saw the most of the hands. <laughs> so, um, I'm doing this presentation together with my um, Colleague from uh, Media Mosa, myself on the bench, and uh, welcome here. Thank you. Um, and he will go into more detail about the foundation itself. <coughs> so, uh, gentlemen, I just explained that the first half will be boring. For you. <laughs> you can have a stroke off. <laughs> Okay, for the rest of you, Media Mosa is open source software to build a digital asset media uh, or a media management platform, a dam. And Media Mosa was part of the SurfNet Kennisnet Innovation Program, which ran for six years between 2006 and 2012. And starting from 2008, when we first had our first uh, edition of Media Mosa, it has been the basis for various successful video services that Surfnet and Kennisnet provided, or used to provide to the Dutch um, educational sector. Uh, I say provided because Surfnet had just ended its uh, video services at the beginning of this year. <coughs> well, this is how uh, Minimosa is organized in an architectural way. It's based on a REST architecture, uh, service-oriented architecture, uh, meaning that um, you would have your typical backend system here. This is your Minimosa backend. You will have a web frontend, which will be your video site, the website, and then the user using the, the web browser to get access to this digital. Um, and the, the common base for Minimosa is Drupal. So we're using Drupal as our framework. And that um, means that it's a great flexibility because there's a lot of modules available from Drupal you can use. And not only Drupal, but all the other tools we're using at Rampack and more are all open source tools. And this kind of setup allows for uh, a capability and future expansion. Well, that uh, sounds very wonderful, you might think, but the main question is, does it have an API? Yes, in fact, it is one big API. Um, you can see as many of those big toolbox, uh, with uh, over 185 services you can address using the REST calls. And these include all the services for playing video, for maintaining video, uh, your, your media management, uh, search engine, uh, your metadata, uh, calls, etc. etc. Uh, we have it organized online on the, this URL if you want to know about it more. Um, and in the past, we have been doing a lot of innovative works with the uh, media box. Um, I just highlighted a few because we are here in a Mapper Warren playground. So we have been looking at Matterhorn integration before, and transcription technology we saw this morning um, is also a, a project we've been looking at. And like I said, it's open and it's public from the first line of code. Well, open source. Open source is 
all about choosing a license, an open source license, having a product, and a very important part of the open source is your community. And the start of an open source project itself does not guarantee creating uh, the creation of a community. So that means you need to put a lot of effort and work into that last part. That is very important. And for that, we um, have a community website online and a demo environment uh, for the community <coughs> to look at and to provide feedback tools for this community. And the community is a, is a growing community and we don't actually know um, who is using MediaMouse at this moment. Uh, because there's a, a, a small community of developers, they are all contributing in the code, and we know those people, and there's a large community of users. And there's a plugin on our website where you can uh, make yourself uh, known uh, using your location and produce a map like that. So we know there's a lot of MediaMouse users all around, spread around the world, but um, uh, it's more a online community, so to say. Um, okay, now we're getting to the point where MediaMosa was started as an innovation project uh, to what it is now, a foundation. And to explain why we did this move, uh, I have something what we call innovation uh, life cycle. And this is very typical, the, the habit of an NRAN, like SurfNet, is that uh, we get funded to do uh, innovation, to do research, and it usually consists of this kind of workflow. So we would do a, a technology assessment, uh, look at customer requirements, uh, we would build a proof of concept, um, if it's a service, we are often the service to the uh, educational institutes, then we would do an impact analysis, then we would develop the service, and then we have the production of the service, and sooner or later we would put this service down, because the whole of the end end is to do innovative work. And when the market uh, offer uh, a lot of uh, uh, likewise services, we can step out and we can look to new projects to do research on. But this is a very typical life cycle um, for instance of certain. And this is an example of the video service I just told, Submedia. It was uh, shut down this uh, beginning of this year. But if you look at uh, services where open source software was you know, a part, an important part of, then this circle is not working anymore, in my opinion. Because until here, you have your service development, your software development, that's quite clear, your software maintenance, that's clear, but what do you do at the end? It's very normal to have a service shut down, but you cannot do the same with software, not when it's open source software. So, we knew the innovation project was coming to an end, and we were looking at our options. So, what were, were the options? Well, the default option was do nothing. Just sit back and, you know, let it go and start a new project and, well, so we will the work, but that's life. And that was not a good option, of course. The second option was to put the code on some kind of online repository, like storage image, and just, you know, let it there for others to get access to, but that didn't feel right at all. Um, and so we are, you know, uh, investigating if we could transfer uh, the code to some kind of consortium, like to call of Arcia. Um, or to create an independent identity out of that. Well, most of the options were dead ends for us, but the uh, option for creating an independent entity, a foundation, uh, seems the one that worked for us. Just looking at my time. 
Um, so we started a foundation. Well, why do you do that? Um, first place, you don't start a foundation if nobody is using your product. It's a waste of effort. Um, but we knew that Minimosa was a popular product, it was an important product for education, um, and it was a mature open source product, so to say. And we wanted to make Minimosa sustainable, so it reaches beyond the life cycle of innovation. And the last bullet, you might ask yourself, why did we have to start a foundation? Well, because we cared for the involvement of international educational institutions. Uh, we knew there was a lot of interest from all kinds of commercial parties, um, but it didn't seem that right if we have been investing a lot of tax money into a product like this um, to give away to some commercial company. So that's why we take, took the step for creating a foundation. So, beginning <coughs> of this year, there was a press release. The Media Mosa Foundation was founded. And um, it was founded by uh, Kennisnet, Servnet, and Ilvitz. These were the founding fathers, so to say. Um, is it your? Okay. So, my name is Michel Rouven, I'm with Louis, as Frank said. Um, I'm on the Media Monster Foundation board. Um, I'll try to explain some of the problems, issues uh, that we came across while building this foundation. If you ever come across similar things, this might contain some information for you that could be useful. Um, the core activities are, of course, the guaranteed future of Media Mosa, to represent the current user base, to encapsulate everything that SurfNet and Kennisnet have created in building this software and the community around it in a more formal and separate structure that can continue even as uh, these organizations step out of it or at least step back. So, what do we came across and what do we have to do in order to set uh, things like this up. First and foremost, you need to involve all parties that have something to do in an important way with the software. And most importantly, the owners of rights, of brands and trademarks. Of course, all authors involved have to make their software available under a open source license, but they still have the author rights, the copyrights to the software. So they need to be involved and they have to uh, cooperate, of course, with the whole process. Um, also, so programmers are important, but also other kinds of authors. There's also websites that have been written, there is documentation that has been written, and these people need to be included uh, in, in uh, the process as well. And there's natural leaders, very important. They can be formal or more informal, but they are always uh, within a community and they have to be involved in this process. And of course, users. Um, try to get as much users on board uh, of the foundation as possible to make it a success. Um, I might say, sadly, there's a lot of legal stuff involved in create, creating a foundation, so make sure you hire a legal counsel. Um, you can get your first funding runs around started in order to pay for this, but you will need <coughs> a lot of paper, paperwork will have to be produced. Uh, notaries will have to put stamps on everything and make things formal. So that's a very important part of the process. And also, you have to be informed on local and global laws. Because a foundation is always tied to a specific country, so you have to adhere to the local laws. But you do not want to exclude other people in other countries from participating in these organizations. So you have to make sure that these are compatible. And of course, you have to hire a notary in order to provide the stamps and have you read out your own texts to you. It's pretty, pretty weird. And of course, uh, in doing this, um, in bootstrapping the foundation groundwork, uh, we did not try to invent new rounder wheels ourselves. We looked very hard at other organizations, 
and for us, especially the free DSD and the DVD community, were pretty much alike to the kind of software, the kind of community, the kind of processes that we, we observed over the past years. So we learned a lot from them and we simply blended materials from them and made our work a little easier in that way. One of the prime documents that have to be created in order to create a foundation is a charter. This charter um, is like the house rules of the foundation. Um, one of the first questions is who establishes the foundation? Um, this has to be a key person, um, mostly an organization, a person acting on behalf of an organization that has, for instance, the most copyrights or has the power to make sure that all assets that go on with an, uh, with an open source software like <coughs> code, authorship, uh, brands, trademarks, etc. can flow into the organization. Of course, you have to establish a name, obviously. You have to write down the goals and make sure you do not limit yourself to uh, too narrow scope and goals. You, you want to be able to represent the software and bring it forward and you do not want to be hindered by your own rules later on in the process. Financial sources, this is the thing. Um, you have to specify uh, what kind of uh, actions you can take in order to collect funding from, from the, the public. Um, and of course you are dependent on it later on, so it's really important. The governance is, uh, in our case, split in two. Of course, there's a board. Uh, we created a foundation according to the Dutch law. So, in the Netherlands, a foundation has to have a board. And this, this has a ceremonial feature. We, like uh, Nibelintus, as we say in Dutch. So, it's, it's mostly the ceremonial part that the board does. And, of course, we have the financial responsibility. We have to make uh, the accounts every year, we have to make sure that we check out and that all the pennies are accounted for. And of course you have to specify who's on it, what are their, their tasks, their responsibilities, uh, how are they to be replaced in the future. And of course, um, you have to be aware that you have to have rules for good and bad times. Um, it's very common to, to only talk about good times and have rules in place for when everything is happy and the sun is shining. There will be times when that's not the case and you have to account for this. And that's something you really have to do beforehand. Um, in our case, we also have an operational board. Um, I'll come back on the, on the next slide. And finally, the financial paperwork has to be put in place. And in our case, we decided to have one of the other foundations that is involved in the creation of Media Mosa and the Chemistnet. They have a very nice financial administrative infrastructure and they just took it on, took it on board and made it part of their regular process, which is of course then part of their sponsoring of the foundation. In our case, we also created a member council with its own charter. The board is ceremonial, has the financial responsibilities. This is where the action is. This is where the programmers are, where the people are who actually work with the software, where the users interact, where the conferences are held, etc. Um, we make this by design not a part of the foundation charter, because then we would have to make this part of the legal process and have a notary with some stamps on it, so you cannot change it. So we took it out of that process and we only wrote down in the charter, well, there has to be a member council charter. And we will create that later on. So this lays down the operational rules. Uh, it lays down the basic roles within the members of the community, uh, which are again the chair, the secretary, the master committer, the, the main code guy who has to be involved in this. Um, and the same things for the other uh, the main charter go as well. So when do you do elections? How do you organize elections? Uh, we opted to do, um, well, mostly the free BSD process. So you have like a, elections can be announced, they can be uh, forced by members. You have then a two month period in which candidates can propose themselves. Then you get a voting round. It's all online, by the way. 
uh, people can vote, and then the secretary will announce who has won the vote, and a new person is put in place for the role. And again, you have to specify how to resolve problems and disagreements, because there will be problems and disagreements. And one of the loopholes we built into this process, because as the board we have to make sure that everything happens within the foundation charter, we can interfere in this process. If there would, uh, a decision would be made that goes outside these borders, we can interfere with that and make sure that it's correct. <coughs> How do we define this community? How do we make people get on board and become part of this? There's the community. This is an undefined whole of everyone who has some, at some point in time done something with media music or is discussing about it, is using it. Who said, well, when you bring any kind of contribution to media music, you can become part of the community, of the membership community. So you bring time, money, or resources, and you become a member. You get a nice sticker for your laptop, t-shirts, etc. Mm -hmm. And when you're a member, you can you become eligible for the board. Why not? You can become <coughs> chairman or secretary. And of course, you can go on the member council. We choose these three options in order to make the barrier for entry as long as possible. So you can contribute in time, you can write code, you can make documentation, you can help us organize an event, simple things like that. You can donate money for projects, for events, for food even. And you can, of course, provide resources. And that's mostly venues and server capacity, for instance, to get into the system. What brings it for you? Um, of course, this is all geared towards keeping the community together and make sure they can organize their common uh, needs to get to bring media as a further. So most of the time we are busy with bringing people together, talking about features needed or features to be improved in the system. Um, we often discover that there are lots of different organizations having the same needs and we bring them together, we align these roadmaps to make sure that the future gets into the system. Of course, it's an opportunity for networking. You get together with like-minded people, dealing with the same problems that your organization has. And it can be an opportunity to be part of a, well, of a nice club of people that shares a common interest. Um, we were very, very common sense cool about it. Uh, we try to be as honest, open, and transparent as possible, so no prison backdoors, whatever. Um, and we try to consider everything from multiple perspectives. And this is something you have to do in order to make it worthwhile and have a maintainable foundation that can carry on into the future for the foreseeable time. So you have to think, <coughs> what would these rule, rules do five years from now? For instance, what if you have a rogue person within the organization that tries to sabotage things. It's, it's balancing between positive uh, happenings within the organization, within the foundation, but also accounting for, for bad things. And of course, you have to make sure that everything is extensible and modifiable so you can grow into the future, of course, within charter limits. Mm, some other considerations that really don't fit into any other category. Um, one of the risks we saw that we would become a financial broker between uh, uh, the, the, the customers and the companies providing the services on media Motor. There are a lot of companies, I, I myself, I work with a company providing uh, commercial services on media Motor. and um, we, there was a risk that we would become a financial broker, so that we would accept money and then we would have to go hire out people and make contracts and do legal stuff. We chose not to do this. We would like to be a linking pin, an informational turn board in which we can coordinate the, the, the communications between these parties, but we would like to see the contracts being written outside of the organization, outside of the foundation. Of course, there is money that comes into the foundation in the form of funding. We accept this 
and of course we deal with this and we, we hire uh, people to do this. Um, but for specific projects that have a commercial background, you will want to be inside this process. Another thing we considered but eventually did not do was uh, have membership fees and voting rights uh, connected to them. This is something you sometimes see within organizations. Um, and then you get big companies coming in and just dominating broadband. Buying votes and, well, this is something we obviously had to scratch from, uh, from, our, uh, from our charter. We didn't want it. So, the lessons learned, um, the organizational issues, prepare for a lot of paperwork. You will spend quite some evenings writing up charters, reading other uh, foundation charters and trying to make a good combination for your own organization. Um, it's, it's all a bit of a balancing act between making sure that uh, the rules are in place, but you do not want to restrict people or organization from participating and entering. You want to make sure that um, it becomes successful. You have to lay a foundation, a groundwork for a successful community. And it's like seeding for plants. Just put little things down and make sure that stuff can grow. Um, about international community members, of course, everything we do in English is the single lingua franca for, uh, for most of the time. And we did not consider any geographical limitations or borders or anything. We made sure that meetings could be taken, uh, can take place anywhere on, well, on Earth, obviously. Um, but no restrictions otherwise. Um, the last one is probably the hardest one. How do you secure your financial independence? Well, just work hard and make sure you get the big companies on board and you have the luck that there is some major uh, stuff, major companies from America uh, chipping into the project and using it to build services and provide services for their customers. Uh, there's people in Italy, in Norway, there's really big infrastructures depending on the amount of so. There is a common need and we try to tap into that and make sure we get financial flow from that. So I'll conclude with a call to action. If you are interested in uh, this material, I invite you to join our community, of course. Talk to us over here. Um, I noticed that there were a lot of people in the room that do not know what Media Mouse is in detail. Uh, Franz told, uh, you know, gave a very broad overview, uh, I'd be more than happy to give you a detailed presentation on digital asset management with MediaMoser if you are interested. Just talk to me and I will uh, we'll take care of it. So, um, using MediaMoser is a very good way to, uh, to further the interests of it and if you have any questions, just contact us. You can find information on the foundation on our new foundation website. And there's the board address where you can contact the, the three of us anytime. So the information, basically if you start from mediamonster.org, it all fans out <coughs> and you can find everything. And now on to the questions. The stroke office. <laughs> Are they spent? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had one. So. You have one left, well. Well, there's more, there's more. Um, so, the first packet goes for the first question. <laughs> package, eh? Yeah? Yeah, that's a single package. No, it's a complete package. So, if you have any questions, you could earn yourself the famous Dutch sofa pop package. <laughs> Otherwise, we all eat them yes, by well, ourselves. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a question ah, stuff. okay. In the beginning, you said that you use the new copy left. Um, that's your license. GPL. That's yeah, GPL. GPL. So, how do large organizations live with that? They don't like GPL. You said that you have a number of large organizations using it. So, is there a dual license? Is there a, a commercial license available as well? There's just a GPL license. So, everything they link is open source, right? Yeah. yeah. And they're happy about it because I know 
I come from IBM, and they don't yeah, like yeah, it. Yeah, I figured it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. It, um, most of the time, it's not a problem, apparently. And of course, we lose users because of this. And one of the major uh, users we lost is Matterhorn. Mm -hmm. We talked to them three, four years ago. They considered building Matterhorn on top of BDM Rosa, and they didn't because of the GPL license. So, but we were happy to provide them with uh, the blueprints, etc. So we, we cooperated, but it was not using the software. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why we are GTL is because we built on top of a number of existing tools, mm -hmm. among which uh, Drupal as a web application framework, and event bank, etc., etc. And they were all GTL. So there was a legal guy who took a look at it and said, well, let's go GPL. Yeah. That's about it. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Yes, please. Enjoy. <laughs> um, I'd say if you know web programming, if you know web services, and you have uh, skills in any, any language that can make REST calls, so that can be Python, PHP, Lisp, uh, Ruby, Java, anything, uh, you're good, you're good. And in order to kickstart you, we have created the Medium Mouse Site Builder, which is a Drupal distribution, so it's PHP, obviously. And it has, uh, we created this in cooperation with Akia, and they have uh, helped us create Fuse modules and stuff like that. So you have a very easy setup to start with. It's like a launching platform, platform for, for your uh, web frontends. But basically, if you know how to make REST calls and how to handle the XML responses, <coughs> you're good. Yes, please. Um, can you tell us, so you talked about Mediamizer and Matterhorn. Does it make sense to use them together and is there anybody doing that? Actually, and then yes. A yes. second question. Could you just briefly tell us how it is different to or the same as or whatever with other similar products like Cultura or the Avalon Media mm -hmm. System or whatever? So the first, the first part is, are they used together? Yes, they are. There are uh, installations where uh, Matterhorn is used as the ingester, mm -hmm. and Media Mouse is used as a digital asset management system and as the distribution platform, because Media Mouse is also very good at distributing. Um, and the, the second part is, um, well, it's, I'd say that uh, Matterhorn is more geared toward uh, ingesting and recording, and working with the video, and Media Mouse obviously is like a toolbox with 185 REST services which focuses on the inner workings. So it's more an engine to build your system on top of, but it provides all these basic services. And in comparison to Kaltura, I'd say, um, well, we could make Media Mouse include into Kaltura if we had 30 million. Uh, dollar as well from uh, round C investors. So they just take it, they provide the same basic services. Um, they have an open source version, but of course once you uh, wander into the more interesting features, you have to pull out your visa. And um, um, they spend more energy on the front end, uh, which we didn't. We uh, In the past, we focused mainly on the back end because that was where the hard work uh, had to go, and now uh, in order to, well, um, stay on par with people like Cultura, we spend more and more energy on the <coughs> yeah. Okay, last package or last question? Thank you. Yep, Are straw bottles good with coffee? <laughs> yeah. That doesn't <laughs> count. <laughs> Very good. And there's a detail of the pro tip. If you have a very nice cup of hot black coffee, you take, you take a stir waffle and you put it on top. And it becomes nice and warm again. This is how you eat them, fresh. Not too long, because they become soggy. <laughs> Just leave it on there for a couple of minutes. Maybe. We'll try this downstairs. Enjoy. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.